Good evening, everyone. And uh, at the very outset, I want to say that what we are about to talk uh, this evening is a favorite book of mine. I have uh, loved it, I think, since the age of 10, starting with a comic book version, uh, then an abridged version, and then finally, uh, the real thing. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, uh, written in 1847. Uh, I I really uh, read it, liked it, understood it to a large extent by the age of 12. Um, we didn't have much access to any uh, films or shows that had been made then. But this book has been uh, adapted so many times that I wanted to give a few over here. But then I decided, you know, that kind of information is available on the net. And I'm sure that you have seen many adaptations of it. Every five or six years, uh, uh, you know, someone will come out with an adaptation of Jane Eyre. And um, it, which actually just shows its popularity. Uh, through the centuries and through the generations. So uh, the book is unforgettable uh, with its strongly delineated characters, its riveting plot, right? It's uh, uh, the ups and downs, the tragedies uh, of, of, of the protagonist, and uh, then the proverbial happy ending. Uh, Jane Eyre is, is, is subtitled an autobiography. It's a fictional autobiography. That is, the narrator is telling her own story. Uh, that there are real autobiographical uh, elements in it is also true, especially with regard to Jane Eyre's. Uh, childhood, but for the rest, it's a it's a beautifully spun uh, story uh, from uh, from the imaginative mind of Charlotte Bronte, uh, who is one of the greatest writers of uh, of England or in the English language. Indeed, her popularity has never waned. Uh, all her books have been bestsellers, never gone out of print. And, uh, uh, you know, they are still around. Each generation has read Jane Eyre, along with Wuthering Heights, written by her sister Emily. These two books have got to be two of the most famous novels that came out of Victorian England or 19th century England. The novel itself can be... Uh, analyzed, viewed, read, studied uh, uh, from different viewpoints. It's a coming of age novel because it shows the uh, events of, a, of a, uh, an individual's life in chronological order. And it shows her uh, uh, the, uh, a buildup of her character and her, her moral development. Okay, till she has reached a certain portion in her life, a certain part of her life when she is uh, a complete human being. So uh, that is a that is a building's roman, a, a word taken from uh, German, uh, which means a coming of age stories. We have many coming of age stories, uh, Great Expectations by Dickens. Um, a tree grows in Brooklyn set in our very own uh, United States in Brooklyn about an Irish uh, immigrant uh, child. Uh, and we have, we have other very famous coming of uh, age stories, including Catcher in the Rye, which I have done here before with you. So this is also a coming of age story. It's also a Beauty and the Beast story, a Cinderella story. It can be taken uh, as, as any of these things. What makes it a, a Cinderella story is, of course, the unhappy childhood, the cruelty that she witnesses at the hands of the relatives she's growing up with, and then the ultimate finding of true love. 
with Edward Rochester. The drawing you see here is one of the early iconic scenes from the book in which she has a confrontation with her aunt Reed, a rich relative with whom she's grown up. Some of these details you might be in fact uh, uh, familiar with because uh, I'm sure that at some point you've read the book or seen a film based on the book. Um, so you would remember Aunt Reed as the as as the as her father's assist, uh, father's uh, sorry as her father's uh, what would what would the relation be? Her um, she is related to Aunt Reed by marriage. Aunt Reed is, is, is the husband of, of Uncle Reed, whose sister Jane Eyre's mother was, if you if you got that. <laughs> I just explained it in a in a rather complicated manner. So she is his, uh, she's her uh, um, uncle's wife. And uh, he 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 dies, right? So do her parents. And they leave her as a baby uh, with 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 the Reeds. Aunt Reed has two, three other children of her own: two uh, two um, uh, girls and a boy. All three of them treat her quite badly. In particular, the boy who bullies her mercilessly, and is and shows cold blooded cruelty towards her. Aunt Reed repudiates her all the time and calls her a wild little thing and, and all kinds of things, locks her up in a room where her uncle had apparently died and where she faints of, uh, of, of fear. Uh, these are some of the early horrific scenes of the, of the book. Okay, and they can be likened to Cinderella being mistreated by her stepmother and uh, uh, stepsisters. Okay, so uh, this is this is one of the scenes in which uh, Aunt Reed uh, decides to send her to a school, but when the uh, chairperson of that school comes to see Jane Eyre at Mrs. Reed's house, uh, she um, paints a character of Jane Eyre, uh, which which is not true at all. And Jane Eyre, who had at by this time started looking forward to going to school, leaving her aunt's cruel home and perhaps making a new beginning for herself, uh, is uh, her hopes are dashed because her character will supposedly go before her to the school and she will be judged according to uh, what, what has been said about her right already so 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 she rebels her spirit her passionate nature her feeling of injustice uh, makes her uh, say uh, uh, vent her pent up feelings to mrs reed right before she leaves this is what we are going to be talking about as i said uh, jane eyre and auto biography Okay, so before I come to this slide, I just want to say that, well, she does go to school and uh, uh, surprisingly, she finds happiness there because the head teacher of the school is very sympathetic towards her and she makes uh, a friend, a friend who is two or three years older than her and uh, with their guidance and their love, she does very well at school in spite of being half starved. Now, this is a charity school run for orphans and for the children of those parents who cannot afford to uh, get, a, get them a proper education or keep them at home. So it's a subsidized kind of an uh, institution, almost like, a, like an orphanage and just as bad as uh, the proverbial orphanage or the foster home. Uh, they are the famous uh, burnt porridge scene, uh, the, you know, the infamous uh, 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 
portrayal of half a slice of bread with one sip of coffee from a mug that goes round the table. So that's what these little girls are forced to do. Uh, eat and subsist on. In spite of that, Jane does well. Okay, now this part of the novel is taken straight from Charlotte Pronte's own life. Uh, she was also, her father was a clergyman. She and her other three sisters were sent to, uh, in fact, all of them at one point, except the youngest one, uh, were sent to uh, Cowan Ridge, which is the model for, for the Lowood School in the novel. And the atrocities that were perpetrated on the students there were taken from real life. But our character is fictional, of course, and she rises above her circumstances and uh, does well at school, continues there for two years as a teacher. At the age of 18, in the meantime, her best friend has died of tuberculosis, as so many children in those days did die, so many adults too. There was no cure for TB. It was called called consumption. Our famous poet John Keats also died in his 20s of consumption. Um, and uh, um, Miss Temple, the sympathetic guiding light, uh, gets married and goes away. So Jane Eyre feels there's nothing left in the school for her and she doesn't have enough money to live an independent life. So she advertises to become a government. And you can see that's how when her adult life becomes uh, starts, and that is actually the most exciting part of the of the book. Um, I do hope that you remember the story because they they are going. No, no uh, lecture is complete on Jane Eyre without really, uh, you know, telling you the whole story. So there will be spoilers. And I hope that uh, if you haven't read the book, uh, I hope those spoilers will not spoil it for you and you'll still go ahead because there's so much more in the book than just uh, the story, just the plot. So just a brief outline of who the Brontes were. Uh, there were six of them. The oldest one was uh, Maria. She died at the age of 11 at the infamous Lowood's uh, Cowan Ridge School. Um, then there was Elizabeth who died at the age of 10. Okay, it is at that point that Charlotte and Emily were taken out of that school by their father, finally, after losing two daughters and educated at home. Charlotte lived the longest, the ripe old age of 39, which today we would find tragic, if not more. Uh, Branwell, the only son, died at the age of 31. He had great promise. He was highly talented as a painter, as a writer, but he took to drugs and, well, that was that. Then we have the famous Emily Bronte, who wrote Wuthering Heights and gave us Kathy and Heathcliff. The love story of Kathy and Heathcliff uh, stands in the same category as, you know, Romeo and Juliet. And so many of those uh, tragic love stories, the star-crossed lovers who never find each other except in death. Um, Although the story, of course, is different, as in uh, Kathy dies young, Heathcliff dies many years later, an embittered, nasty old man, but but the story is 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 still uh, is still legendary, and there is often a comparison between the male protagonist of Jane Eyre, who is Edward Rochester, and uh, the male protagonist of uh, Wuthering Heights, who is. Heathcliff. Many debates have taken place as to which is the better character, which is the more popular character, etc. Uh, if you want, I will do Wuthering Heights with you whenever I get an opportunity. Okay, so and then lastly, there was Anne, who also wrote three novels. 
Okay. Her most famous one is uh, Agnes Grey. And her other the other one she wrote was The Tenant of Wild Phil, Wild Fell Hall. Uh, Agnes Grey is again semi-autobiographical. It tells the story of a of a governess and the trials and tribulations she faces uh, in the home of, of rich people with spoiled brats. Okay, so these were the the uh, Bronte sisters. Uh, they all, well, more or less died of uh, uh, complications arising from tuberculosis. This, if you remember, was the uh, industrial age in England when factories were being built all over the place. Child labor was rampant so beautifully uh, and heartbreakingly described by uh, Charles Dickens in, in practically most of his novels. And what was worst was that the pure, uh, the purity of the English countryside was being polluted by the rubbish that flowed out of the factories. Their drinking water was pollu polluted. So one of the raging epidemics in those days was something called typhus. Okay, and Maria and Elizabeth both probably died of typhus. Uh, as in the book too, there is a typhus epidemic in the school but after that conditions improve in the school so it's only for a year or two that Jane faces extreme hardship and starvation but after that things become better so by the time she's 18 she's educated right and she's healthy which was the main thing okay here are the Bronte novels uh, Jane Eyre was written in 1846, but published in 1847. Agnes Grey by Anne uh, was 1847. Wuthering Heights by Emily, 1847. Uh, the Tenant of Wild Fell Hall by Anne was 1848. Shirley by Charlotte was 1849. And then Villette by Charlotte uh, was um, in 1853. Um, it is to be noted that Charlotte wrote Villette after all her siblings had died. Uh, it is one of the saddest novels that I have ever read. When I say sad, I don't mean tragic. There have been much more tragic novels, you know, written throughout the world with, with occurrences, with events or, or in it uh, or in them which are very, very tragic. So, but this is a novel, a long novel. It has a note of loneliness, heartbreak and sadness throughout the book. You, when you read it and you know a little of the background, you'll realize that Charlotte wrote it when only her father was alive. All her siblings were gone by that time. Okay. Uh, Jane Eyre was published in 1847 and created a storm in the literary world. It was heavily co uh, criticized for coarseness, an unnaturally bold heroine, an indictment of organized religion and immorality. Today, it is one of the most widely read books in the world and ranks amongst the first 10 greatest books ever to have been written. Why was it criticized for those things that I've mentioned above? Mostly because here Charlotte created a heroine who spoke her own mind. She was not a shrinking violet, to use a cliche. 
of Victorian times who could not open her mouth in a in a in a widely uh, uh, patriarchal society she was a girl who spoke for herself she did not hide her feelings uh, behind uh, a, a coy uh, and a, and a, and a silent exterior when she felt strongly she spoke. She rebels against Mrs. Reed. She, she throws a fit when Mrs. Reed's uh, son, John, uh, throws a book at her on purpose. He makes her stand in front of her and he says, now stay there, don't. And he aims a hardbound book at her. And she she actually fights with him, which is the reason she's locked up in the red room, because, of course, nobody is going to listen to her, right? Her side of the story. When she grows up and falls in love with the master of the house where she is working as a governess to his ward, Edward Rochester is his name. Again, an iconic, Byronic hero of uh, Victorian literature. Um, she, she tells him at one point when she's driven to it and push comes to shove, she makes no effort to hide her feelings. Okay, now this was something which Victorian readers and critics and scholars Critics and scholars being, of course, male, right? Uh, let's be very clear about that, mostly. Um, they, they could not take this kind of a heroine. A, 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 a heroine, the heroine of a novel, like many of Dickens's heroines, for example, uh, should be pretty, they should be demure, they should not have a tongue in their head. They should listen to their fathers, their brothers and their husbands. Okay, here was an independent girl who didn't have a father or a brother or, or a husband at that point and who really didn't much care because she had so much self-reliance. She had been forced to be so self-reliant. And in the course of the book, we will see that she gained so much of confidence they were, that, that she could speak for herself. And she was amply rewarded for it in the end. Uh, she was, there were only two things lacking in this heroine. She did not have any money. So the question of a good marriage did not arise. And horror of horrors, she was not pretty. Okay. Again and again, she tells us, I was playing. How reliable is her narrative at this point? If you read the book thoroughly five or six times, there are moments in which we hear other people say, how lovely you look, how fresh and blooming you look. Edward Rochester finds her beautiful. <laughs> right? But it's made very clear to the readers that she does not fit into that mold of golden locks, blue eyes, rosy cheeks, regular features. So she's at a disadvantage in English society. But she does, does beautifully. She does very well as a governess. She's well read. She has a good education. Her little pupil, Adele, who is the daughter of a, of a, one of Edward Rochester's French uh, mistresses. She adores her. She's liked by the housekeeper. She's liked by the servants. Edward Rochester enters the book quite late, kind of, you know, after it's one-fourth over a little more, and uh, finds in her something that he has not found in all his travels in any other woman. He's overpowering. 
is overwhelmingly masculine. He's used to getting his own way, right? But in spite of that, here is this little chit of a girl who stands up to him. So they have very stimulating conversations and ultimately fall in love with each other. In the meantime, of course, because it's also called a gothic romance, uh, we we have this house called Th Thornfield in which in which she in which they are living, right? And there is an unseen presence in this house who is up to no good. She sets Edward Rochester's she or it at this point we don't know what it is. She sets Edward Rochester's bedroom on fire. Uh, um, a, a strange uh, man uh, comes to, to visit them and we find that she takes a knife to him. She's in the she's in the upper regions of the of the of the uh, house. That's where she's she's kept under lock and key. The two days before Jane and Rochester's wedding she uh, comes to Ro Jane's room. Jane at first thinks it's a nightmare, but next morning she finds that her wedding veil has been ripped to pieces. It's been neatly ripped, torn. So, but in any case, the day of the wedding uh, arrives and uh, we find that you know, at that point when, when we are told, when uh, the priest asks anyone in the church, if there is any impediment, if they know of any impediment to the marriage, this is the time to speak. That's part of the Christian wedding ceremony, right? At that point, two men come from the back of the church. They walk to the front and they say, there is an impediment. This man has a wife already who is alive. So it transpires that one of the men is a lawyer and the other man who had also, who Jane had met earlier because he, had, he was the one who had been knifed by this uh, creature, whoever she was, is, uh, is, is the wife's brother, the wife who's still alive. And then, of course, it doesn't take long for either Jane or the readers to discover that that unseen evil presence in the house is Bertha Mason, Edward Rochester's mad wife. My personal experience with the book at that age, I remember the horror that filled me uh, when, I, when I learned of this. And strangely, I un I was able to understand Jane's moral dilemma. Bigamy was a crime in Victorian England. Okay. And, uh, well, not Victorian England, but a little before that. And the <clears throat> book may have been written in 19, uh, 1847, but it is set about 20 years earlier. And at that time, it was a criminal offense to have two wives at the same time. Edward Rochester has committed not only a sin, but a crime. However, Charlotte Bronte doesn't touch on the criminal aspect of it at all. This is a deeply religious book. It, it, it criticizes organized religion, but it also has a strong moral fiber running throughout it. Rochester begs Jane's forgiveness. He begs her to forgive him for what was about to happen. Okay. And then begs her to live with him. He says, I will take you far away. No one will ever know, but I cannot live without you. And Jane refuses. She says in a famous dialogue or a speech or a soliloquy rather you know she's talking to herself and she says i would rather be alone and friendless and penniless than sacrifice 
my moral being and live with another man without uh, out of wedlock. I will not be Edward Rochester's mistress. This is the defining moment, the climax of the book. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I, my, my slides are not really matching what I'm saying, but I'd rather that you got a complete picture of the of the book uh, from what I'm uh, talking right at this moment. And of course, all these themes are here, and you know you can read them and and then uh, think about them in your mind for the moment. So I'm just going ahead with the plot for now, so you know how Jane's character develops. So. So she leaves. She leaves the house in the middle of the night, loses her whatever money she has on the way, finally arrives at a village, starving, almost, almost dead, and, and finds herself outside the door of the village uh, uh, priest, the, the clergyman who's looking after that particular parish. Uh, she is uh, sent away by the housekeeper who thinks she's a beggar. But then fortunately, uh, the clergyman um, finds her there and takes her inside his home. Mm -hmm. His name is St. John Rivers, another uh, very, very important character in the book because this is now the third man in her life. The first one was Mr. Brocklehurst, the cruel bigoted, narrow-minded, hypocritical uh, gentleman who ran the Lowood School. Okay, the second one was Edward Rochester, who with all his faults loved her to distraction. Okay, this is the third man in her life. And by a series of happy coincidences, we realize that St. John Rivers and his two sisters are cousins of Jane Eyre. In modern times, there are, there are two or three, three things which are up for uh, criticism. Um, one of them is, of course, the moral dilemma of Jane Eyre in... Uh, running away from Thornfield rather than become Rochester's mistress, as she would have been called then, and she would have no place in society. Right? Today, men and women live together, and it's a, we, 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 don't, we don't call it immoral or sinful. Uh, it's an accepted thing. But the problem here, and no doubt that problem would be here today also, uh, that he has a wife who's living. He cannot divorce her, by the way, because madness was not a criterion for divorcing your spouse at that time. So he could not divorce her. She was... She was an embarrassment to him. She was violent. And uh, so he, he locked her up in his house. Um, there's a very famous book uh, called The Mad Woman in the Attic. And that is about uh, feminism and the woman in 19th century um, British uh, fiction. So it deals with the novels of George Eliot, Jane Austen, and the Bronte sisters. Okay, because women were closeted in the figurative sense of the word. So Bertha Mason's story has been told by a writer in the 70s called Jean Rice, R-H-Y-S, Jean Rice. Rice, I'm not sure. Uh, it's called, it's a thin novel, it's a, it's a novella, and it's called White Sargasso Sea. So it's a kind of prequel to Jane Eyre because it tells the story of Edward's uh, mad wife, 
before she came to England. She was brought up in the West Indies. And she was Creole. Okay, so she wasn't fully white. And uh, Edward Rochester, in his own words, was tricked into the marriage by his greedy father and uh, brother because Bertha Mason's family had a lot of money and they didn't tell him that she had the seeds of madness in her. So that's another story altogether. You understand? But for now, she's locked up on the top story of uh, Thornfield. And there she will remain, right, for now, until we deal with, you know, what happens to Jane. So happily, it turns out that they are, they are, her, they are her cousins. And even more happily, it turns out that she had an uncle in Madeira. Okay, who's, uh, the knowledge of whom had been hidden by Mrs. Reed out of nothing but spite and hatred from her. And he, on dying, left a sum of 20,000 pounds to her. 20,000 pounds would be a lot of money in those days. In the meantime, of course, she's found her cousins. And she's more happy about getting a family than about the money. So she happily and against their will and in spite of their protestations, shares the money with them. So each one, because she feels that they are also entitled to that money because the uncle who died was also their uncle. So these series of coincidences, you know, you'll have to read the novel as to how it all came about. And it took some time for them to realize that uh, their mother's maiden name had been Eyre and Jane Eyre was Jane Eyre because of her father. But when she met them and uh, entered their house as a, as a half-starved woman, she didn't want to be found out by Rochester. So she gave a false last name. So that's why it didn't come out earlier. But eventually it does come out when they realize that her real name is Air. And uh, she shares this uh, money with them. All good, right? But St. John Rivers, who's an evangelist and has missionary zeal in him to the nth degree, wants to go to India as a missionary. Okay? For this, he is sacrificing his sisters who are to be left alone in England to fend for themselves. He is to uh, say no uh, to the girl who wants to marry him, who's desperately in love with him. So he is to repudiate her love, right? He is to deny whatever love he has in his heart for her because for him the love of God and a place at my Lord's side after I die is more important to him. Okay, so these deep themes of religion, the extremism that religion can lead you to, that you can become so indifferent to uh, the the to your to relationships in this world. That's Saint John Rivers. Uh, he's a he's a highly educated man, but he wants to. But he wants to, according to the others, you know, they throw away his life as a missionary when he could do so much good in his own parish. But that's not what he wants. Everything is to the glory of God. He wants to spread the word. 
to 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 the heathens as they were called and you are aware of course that starting from the 14th and 15th centuries uh, christian missionaries went all over the world africa to bring christianity uh, to the world and uh, well he's one of them by that time uh, the british empire was at its uh, peak and practically half the world was comprised the british empire so that's where he wants to go to show the light to the to the to the people of india who worshiped many gods etc etc all this under you know air quotes uh, because I really can't there's no time to go into all this but the fact remains that yes colonialism is one of the themes of the book right and uh, guess what at this point in the novel Sinjin Rivers tells Jane Eyre to marry him and come to him with uh, to India to go there and be a missionary's wife and Jane Eyre says but I do not have the vocation I do not have the missionary zeal I do not want to go among strange people to spread the word of Christ I'm not made for that hard life and even his sisters tell him don't do this. Don't force her. The weather alone will kill her, which is probably true. Okay. So, uh, well, but his, he is so, his personality is so uh, magnetic. It is so mesmerizing and so hypnotic that she starts coming under his spell and she's practically brainwashed into believing that uh, that uh, you know uh, that that this could be a possibility for her future and the reason she gives the strongest reason she gives for this is that there is nobody for me here in england the man i loved i cannot marry right he's lost to me forever so, well, just let me go there. But then she knows she's not made for it. So, let's leave them there at this point. He's almost convinced her. Okay? And uh, let's just come to these themes since I have this uh, slide open in front of me. By now, from whatever I've said... Um, you would have made out, of course, that these are the main themes of the, of the, of the book: love, childhood, feminism. I told you she's a very strong character. Uh, colonialism, religion, sin, hypocrisy. Okay, ambition, because that's Sinjin Rivers for you. He wants to make his name uh, as a missionary. Not in this world, but in the next world. Family, how important family is, how cruel family can be, how loving a family can be. And then finally, there is redemption. So there is sin, but there is redemption also. Okay, so she has already almost decided and she goes to him. And she says, I will come with you as your wife. If only I know in my heart that this is the right thing for me to do. At this point, my heart is silent. It's not telling me to go with you. It's not saying anything at all. But then, you know what? At this particular point, she hears a voice calling her. And she has no doubt whose voice it is. It's calling out her name. And she rushes from there and she says, Edward, Edward, I am coming. Okay? And it's Edward Rochester's voice calling out to her, asking her, Jane, where are you? 
Next day, she packs her bags and she says, look, you have to wait for my answer. There is someone I have to see in England before I leave forever. You know that at that time, you couldn't fly in and out of London, out of Heathrow Airport, right? It took three months from England, Liverpool or Southampton to go to the port of Bombay because the Swiss Canal had not yet been opened. So you had to go all the way down to Africa through the Cape of Good Hope and then on to the Indian Ocean. So people didn't come back so often, maybe once in 10 years if they survived. So she says, I have someone to see. I have to find out if he's fine. So she goes to Thornfield. And she finds that Thornfield is in ruins. You know, I'm probably telling you something you already know. Uh, but, well, if you read the book, then you know what happens. She finds out the story. It's burnt to the ground. So from the innkeeper, she finds out the story that there was a mad woman living in the house. She turned out to be Rochester's wife. One day, she took a torch light, you know, a fire uh, torch light at that time was, you know, made out of flames of fire. And she started uh, setting the house on fire. She started with Rochester's bedroom. Okay. And she, she uh, lit up the whole house. She set fire to it and then went to the top of the, went to the roof. And she was standing there laughing madly. And Rochester went up to save her. But she threw herself from the ramparts and uh, crashed to the ground below. When Rochester, in the meantime, tried to save the other servants, a beam fell on him. And he lost the use of one of his... Uh, he lost a, a, lost a hand. One hand was uh, amputated. And he lost his eyesight. So she asks the innkeeper, where is he now? Is he dead? So she says, no, he's living in another house that he owned deep in the woods. So she goes there and she finds Edward Rochester being looked after this old servant couple. He's in a bad shape. He cannot see. What well, He's an amputee. There's, no, there's nothing in his life. And well, she goes to him, identifies herself. Can't wait for him to uh, ask her to marry him. He's a free man now. Right? And she says, yes. One of the most iconic lines of Jane Eyre is, Reader, I married him. So when I talk about redemption, I say that I'd, Edward Rochester was punished by providence for his sin. Right? But he got a second chance. He got a second chance in this very world. He got a second chance at happiness. He did redeem himself by trying to save his mad wife, he could have let her die, which he did ultimately. And he lost his sight because of her. But then Jane came back to him. And yes, apparently there was a telepathic uh, connection uh, between them. That's why she heard him cry out. And when she said, I am coming, wait for me, well, apparently he also heard that and he thought it's a figment of his imagination. So, well, these are the, you know, characters in the book. Jane A., Edward Rochester, St. John Rivers, Helen Burns, Blanche Ingram, a society lady who wants to marry Edward Rochester. Uh, Miss Temple is the kind uh, teacher in the school. Mrs. Fairfax is the Thornfield's housekeeper. Helen Burns is her friend at uh, Lowood School. Mr. Brocklehurst is the chairperson. 
the hypocritical uh, clergyman who starves the girls uh, and uh, but the three and and uh, yeah I, and Bessie is a servant at uh, at at Gateshead at Mrs. Reed's house who was kind to Jane when she was uh, a child but the three main characters are Jane Eyre, Edward Rochester and St. John Rivers right so these two men she could never have married St. John Rivers. She would have been deeply unhappy. And she could not have married Edward Rochester or lived with him as his wife without marriage because then too she would have been deeply unhappy. Right? So here is a Victorian heroine or a 19th century heroine who decides that she would rather be alone then make an unhappy marriage. That's why she's unable to say yes to St. John Rivers. And she does not. She categorically refuses to be Rochester's uh, mistress. Right? This was, of course, the easier choice. And any Victorian uh, reader or critic would have said, well, of course, she should have married St. John Rivers. But no, she prefers to be alone. And that is why, as a heroine, she was way uh, ahead of her times. Okay, let me just quickly go through these slides. And because we have only uh, uh, five or six minutes, and I do want to uh, hear your opinion. The book is riveting. You must read it again. And I hope that after this, you will want to read it again. Okay, so these are some quotes from the novel. I can live alone if self-respect and circumstances force me to do so. I need not sell my soul to buy bliss. Then she says, I care for, she's a deeply individualistic character. I care for myself. The more solitary, the more friendless, the more unsustained I am, the more I will respect myself. Now, these are statements that women are beginning to make again today. Right? They are not allowing men, for example, to take this life decisions for them. Do you think I'm an automaton, a machine without feelings? Life appears to me too short to be spent in nursing or registering wrongs. These are some of the uh, famous quotes from Jane Eyre. And the one which is my favorite is this one. I am no bird and no net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will. And then, of course, the iconic uh, ending. Reader, I married him. The quintessential happy ending.